Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and as I don't get out much anymore, can I welcome this opportunity to contribute to this first an extremely good-natured uh, debate of the new year. Uh, can I begin by saying that I don't think it's enough to say bad SNP. I think charitably at the heart of the government motion is a, a question, what is the legitimate and democratic route to a second referendum? And what I absolutely believe is that eight years of trading insults across this chamber, which is largely what we have done since 2014, has not advanced the argument one iota or one jot. I agree in part with Michael Mara that I think that there are democratic routes towards uh, another expression of Scotland's opinion. They just don't happen to be ones in which we agree. Firstly, since the Supreme Court has determined that responsibility for the Constitution rests at Westminster, it's for MPs elected from Scotland, as Mr Gray and Mr Robertson were, to argue at the House of Commons in favour of the argument that they have for a second independence referendum and to seek as Mr Mara did, to persuade, to construct a consensus around the argument that that second referendum should take place. They say that inevitably that is not a prospect that can succeed. I don't fundamentally agree. I, I, time is short, but I may come back. Secondly, is to respect the view of the First Minister and others at the time, which was that this was a once-in-a-generation vote. You know, there has never been, never in the eight years since, has there been a discussion as to what a generation is a negotiation as to what, in this chamber, we could agree a generation might be. Um, it is typically, in print, argued to be between 20 and 30 years, 25 years typically. It's said that there are three or four generations in any 100 years. Arguably, that might say that this Parliament could legitimately, on the words of the First Minister, look to another referendum in 2039. But it is a subject about which the Government has never sought to engage other parties in this Parliament in any discussion whatsoever. What Mr Robertson did in this debate was to keep returning to the concept of mandate. He said again that the Conservatives have not had a mandate in Scotland since 1955. I think he said, votes matter, votes count, without a shred of irony. Because sitting in his government are the Scottish Green Party, participating with the lowest share of the vote of any governing party in the history of the United Kingdom. 91.9% of the people of Scotland rejected the Scottish Greens and all they stand for at the 2021 election. It was even, I will in a second, I will in a second, it was even worse in my west of Scotland region where my Eastwood seat sits because there... There, Mr Greer, who disports himself now quite obviously as the self-ordained minister-in-waiting, was rejected by 92.9% of the people of Scotland. What mandate does that man have to stand up and boast that he's imposing green policy on the people of Scotland? First, Deputy First Minister. I, Deputy First Minister. I, 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 I'm grateful to Jackson Carlow for giving me. Can I just point out the irony of his attack on the Butte House agreement between the SNP and the Greens? coming from a Conservative who was prepared to usher in austerity into the United Kingdom with the accompaniment of the Liberal Democrats and only the accompaniment of the Liberal Democrats who are roundly rejected across the United Kingdom. Can I just point out the absurdity of the argument which characterises what Jackson Carlos Putin Jackson does Carl. after Jackson Carl. I think the Deputy First Minister, if he che checks the voting record, will find that the Liberal Democrats had something like 25% of the vote when that coalition was formed. However, there is a route through the, as from the Supreme Court for a negotiation in the House of Commons or to return, uh, in the meantime, to accept the responsibility of this Parliament. Between 2011 and 2016, I, when I spoke on health, agreed and offered to take the National Health Service off the football pitch to try and work together to find a consensus around how we might proceed. Alec Neil, in fact, as Health Secretary, even convened meetings between all other parties. All of that was set aside when the 2015 election came about. But if the Health Service is struggling in England under the Conservatives, under the, in Wales under the Labour Party, in Scotland under the SNP, by what conceit does any one party think they can say, we and we alone can now offer a solution to the crisis which is now evolving on health? Would it not be far better to listen to people like Wes Streeting, who I read an article on an interest at the weekend, who talked about a working partnership with the private sector, a new model for GP primary care, to those who have talked about reopening the Nightingale wards as places where early discharge patients could go to free up space within our NHS, to listen to GPs like our own Sandesh Gulhani? Would it not be far better for us to work in concert 
to seek to try and find a solution, rather than simply individually firing forward ideas, which everybody else then shoots down. The NHS carries on, workers you do, do so in despair, but there is no political solution whatsoever. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I say this? Does this Parliament have a future based on the model envisaged for it by its creators and pioneers? That was for this Parliament to evolve the greatest possible consensus on issues that we possibly could. Bludgeoning ourselves on the divisive issue of independence you, is setting Carlock. aside all the work we could do Mr. on Carlock, these priorities for Scotland.